This short video is a supplement to my recently released video entitled, The Carnivore Diet, Short-Term Hype, Long-Term Problems. I thought this study illustrated a connection very well, and it deserved to be highlighted on its own. In my carnivore video, I discuss how in a high-protein diet, residual protein makes its way down to the lower gastrointestinal tract, where it can be fermented into toxic compounds and reduce health motors in the microbiome. And in my older video on PPIs, I highlight the strong connection between PPIs and disease to include C. diff infections via the same mechanism of protein fermentation and dysbiosis. Now, we'll highlight this connection as further proof that a carnivore diet is not health promoting. And although the carnivore fanatics will ignore this information, the more critical thinkers out there will begin to realize there is a better way to go about addressing their health. Digestion actually begins in the mouth, but from a chemical viewpoint, truly begins in earnest in the stomach. HCL is critical for a variety of reasons, but for our purposes here, the degradation of protein from meals. If you inhibit protein degradation in the stomach with PPIs, or if you ingest too much protein in your diet, i.e. carnivore diet, the result will be fermentation of protein in the lower GI, and this is a bad thing. So, think about this for just one second. If PPIs have tons of data showing that they drive disease through a protein fermentation-based dysbiosis, i.e. C. diff, and the carnivore diet also results in excess protein fermentation delivered to the lower gut, the fermentation, then how is it that PPIs are bad for your microbiome, but the carnivore diet is good for your microbiome? Just a brief pause here in the presentation. If you could just hit like and subscribe, it would really help this channel out. These researchers labeled egg protein and analyzed two exhaled compounds. In figure B and C, you can see significant differences between the PPI group and the healthy controls in the amount of protein that was assimilated, in other words, absorbed by your small intestine. This makes sense, right? If you reduce the amount of HCL in the stomach, you're not able to denature protein as well and activate the protease pepsin, which has done so at a pH which is exceeded by PPIs. So the protein that is not absorbed, i.e. assimilated, makes its way down to the lower gut, where it has but two fates. It can be used as building blocks by the microbiome, or it can be fermented by the microbiome. And remember, as I frequently say, the bad bacteria tend to favor protein in both respects, utilization and fermentation. So let's take a look at fermentation. These researchers also looked at urinary excretion of total phenols and P. cresol, which is probably the most important of the phenols. Now, you have to understand that P. cresol is a proven toxin, and the only source of these phenols is bacterial fermentation. In Table 4, we see a significant increase in total phenols after one week, and very robust but oddly not significant increases in P. cresol and total phenols after one month in Table 5. Do you know where else you see this signature? in high-protein diets. Do you know where you see the opposite of this? With a healthy microbiome. You can learn more about all of this in my videos on cardiovascular disease and the carnivore diet and my soon-to-be-released video on chronic kidney disease. This fermentation of proteins drives a dysbiotic microbiome via several mechanisms to include pH, one of the all-important topics I frequently highlight watch that video. A dysbiotic microbiome drives inflammation both within and outside of the gut. I make this point over and over again, with plenty of references in each presentation. I know what I say offends some people because it disagrees with their beliefs, but I'm simply stating the facts. The vast majority of my comments are from people who love the material I provide and whose lives I dramatically improve for the better with my protocols and consultations. As the former director of medical education for a microbiome firm, and now with my own platform, I invite you to watch my videos, and after doing so, I challenge you to show me anything out there that exists with this level of content. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. And I will say that uh, basically every single day on my YouTube comments and in emails, I get a lot of thanks from people out there who really appreciate the information I've been sharing. And so part of that is you're welcome. The other part is you can contribute by uh, doing clicking on the super thanks below. And if you're not uh, doing a consultation with me and you're not purchasing any protocols, it's a great way to support this channel. Uh, each presentation, depending on you know, the presentation, uh, but most of them take an incredible amount of time to put together. There's a lot of material. There's a lot of data checking. And so it's just, it's just you know, sometimes 50, 60, 70 hours to put together one presentation. And so if you can just click that super thanks, I'd appreciate that. And we'll keep the information coming.